families, creating a lifetime of memories. Sadly, some families are denied these important moments due to the sad practice of alienation. These are Families Divided. Hello, everyone, and welcome to Families Divided. In this segment, Dr. Colleen Murray interviews Dr. Mandy Matheson in regards to assessments and interventions. Also, we'll have a segment from the Law Center regarding false allegations of abuse. And we will also hear from Dr. Jeff Gardier, who is better known as America's Psychologist. He is our keynote speaker at our upcoming in-person only conference in September. So you'll wanna hear him and I do hope you can join us. All this takes place right after these messages. At Victor's Crown, our focus is on you, our clients. When you arrive, our goal is that you will feel at home from our welcoming atmosphere to our serene surroundings. Everything we do at Victor's Crown is done with our clients in mind. We have comfortable seating areas for both adults and children. A large screen TV with surround sound where clients can be occupied with wholesome entertainment while they wait. We offer complimentary refreshments such as coffee, tea, water, and snacks. Due to the present COVID pandemic, our in-person appointments are restricted to selected cases and those are held in our luxurious outdoor open air meeting space that we affectionately refer to as the COVID cabana, which was built specifically for our clients to offer them the most comfortable and relaxing outdoor space available. All our other clients are offered secured web-based telemed sessions where they can connect with us from anywhere in the world. Divorce and co-parenting are a major life interruption for families, especially the kids, but also for parents and grandparents. And it's even worse in blame-filled, high-conflict cases. When parents engage in alienation by turning the kids against the other parent or grandparents, kids suffer. They're denied the opportunity to build the four big skills necessary for future resilience. New Ways for Families online class can help. Parents learn to use our popular Biff and Ear skills to calm the conflict and stop the hostile emails and texts. And we even have a class for kids and parents to learn together. Research shows a 75% improvement in joint parental decision making after this course is taken, plus overall improvements for kids' well-being. Don't wait to make this affordable investment in your children's future and improve your well-being too. Start learning new ways for your family today at conflictplaybook.com. In families dealing with alienation, communication during conflict is often very difficult. This fall, Family Access, Fighting for Children's Rights, will present a special in-person conference to address that very issue. Using and Refining Interpersonal Skills will be held September 9th through the 11th at the Marriott Research Triangle Park in Durham, North Carolina. You'll learn from experts how to master skills that can reduce anxiety, anger, and stress in alienation situations. Join event director Elaine Cobb, the founder and president of Family Access Fighting for Children's Rights, and conference moderator Dr. Colleen Murray as they present a lineup of highly respected experts, including keynote speaker Dr. Jeffrey Gardier, plus presentations by Bill Eddy, Megan Hunter, Dr. Joshua Coleman, Dr. Mark Mosk, Dr. Mary Alvarez, Dr. William Burnett, 
Dr. Sue Kornbluth, Shazia Sparkman, and Lisa Rothfuss. Mark your calendar now, September 9th through the 11th, for Using and Refining Interpersonal Skills, hosted by Family Access, Fighting for Children's Rights, Steel Partners Foundation, and PAICA, Parental Alienation is Child Abuse. Visit familyaccess.info for more details on the conference and secure your attendance. Seating is limited. Hello everyone, my name is Dr. Jeff Gardier, better known as America's Psychologist, and I'll have the honor of delivering the keynote speech, Parental Alienation, It Can Happen to You. When we think of parental alienation, we usually think of an evil parent turning a child against the other parent for their own gain. The reality is that even well-meaning parents who may be in conflict and have the best interests of the child at heart can unconsciously or passive-aggressively participate in parental alienation. So in my talk, I will detail and provide the psychology behind these types of innocent behaviors, how they manifest, and how we can prevent or mitigate them. So I look forward for their conference in Durham, North Carolina from September 9th through the 11th, 2022, and I hope to see you all there. The topic of false allegations of abuse is complicated and deserves immediate attention. In particular, there needs to be a focus on the alienating beliefs that often underlie and compel false allegations. False allegations of abuse are all too common during divorce and child custody proceedings. One parent makes false allegation against the other for leverage in court and to undermine the other parent-child relationship. The frequency of false allegations haven't been measured, with estimates ranging as low as 2% to as high as 35% of all cases involving children. Nonetheless, attorneys, judges, and mental health experts know that it's a serious problem. Nothing can create chaos in a case more than an allegation of abuse that eventually proves to be false. Parents never admit to lying, and proving an allegation is false can be extremely challenging. Why? Because a false allegation is hatched in the mind of the offending parent, who then enlists the help of their innocent child to carry out the plot. The intent is to harm the other parent while pretending to be the real victim. An allegation of abuse will help them win their case, and honesty or fairness isn't a priority in a high-conflict custody case. Detecting a false allegation is critical because judges can be swayed by the accusation even if it isn't proven. More often than not, custody decisions go in favor of the accusing parent. So uncovering and exposing a false allegation is vital to prevent this unfairness from happening. The surest way to prove a false allegation of abuse is to uncover the alienating belief system of the offending parent that underlie a parent's decision to make the false allegation. With careful interviewing and psychological testing, these beliefs can be brought to the surface which can help expose the lie. A mental health professional with patience and a probing attitude is best suited to address this issue. Here are seven common alienating beliefs that occur in false allegations. 1. I'm afraid our child will love you more than me and will want to live with you. 2. I want my child all to myself. 3. If you don't want me, you don't get our child either. 4. I want to exact revenge on you, and what better way than to deprive you of your child? Number five, I don't want my child to be anything like you. Six, I've been the real parent in this family, not you. Number seven, I don't want my child to love their new step-parent because I might be pushed out. There are important implications to consider in cases of false allegations of abuse. First, the desire to alienate the child from the other parent is at core of most of these situations. And when a parent makes multiple false allegations during a legal proceeding, you can bet that alienating beliefs are in play. It's important to note that not all false allegations are due to alienating motives. 
Sometimes, for example, a parent may overinterpret a comment or report from a child, thereby jumping to an erroneous conclusion. Rather than clarifying the benign situation, the parent makes what proves to be a false allegation. Second, a child needs to love both parents without interruption. Being caught in a loyalty fight is damaging as all children need both parents and anything short of that is unacceptable. A false allegation of abuse can go a long way to disrupt a child's relationship with the accused parent and it can have tragic negative impact on the child. Third, offending parents tend to view their children as possessions to be controlled and manipulated. They see them as extensions of themselves. That's not parental love, but rather a narcissistic self-absorption to meet their own needs, not the child's. Teaching a child to be a victim under false pretenses can set the stage for a lifetime of victimhood for the child. Fourth, vindictiveness is a malignant emotion that's profoundly unhealthy and is common in false allegations of abuse. What's portrayed as protectiveness of the child is actually hostility and destructiveness toward the other parent with little genuine concern for the child's best interests. Fifth, false allegations of abuse must be stopped as soon as possible for the child's well-being. If they're not stopped, the offending parent's pernicious behavior will gain steam and impact over time. Several preventive measures are reasonable. Limited parenting time, supervised visits, change of custody, court-ordered therapy, and others. Turning a blind eye to a false allegation of abuse is not an option. Finally, judges and attorneys need to be educated about the seriousness and harmful effects of false allegations of abuse, and mental health experts can help in court. False allegations and alienation are highly disruptive to the well-being and mental health of the child. In conclusion, be assured that the alienating beliefs behind false allegations can be uncovered and exposed, which is the key to unlocking the proof of a false allegation. Without exposing these alienating beliefs, a child custody case can be hijacked by a false allegation and the child's well-being may be lost in the confusion. After all, it's not just another parent, but a child's future that's at stake. Written by Dr. Alan Blotke and produced by the Law Center. Click the link in the description portion of this video to learn more about them. Hello and welcome to this segment of Families Divided. Today I'll be talking with Mandy Mathewson about assessments and interventions for parental alienation. Welcome, Mandy. How are you today? Hi, I'm good, thank you. How are you? I'm well, thank you. I know that down in Australia right now, it is early in the morning as we're wrapping up here at night. And so thank you so much for joining us. Thank you for inviting me. Oh, it is a pleasure to have you here today. So I understand that you are the lead researcher of the Family um, and Interpersonal Relationship Lab at the University of Tasmania. That's uh, right. Can you share with us, oh, sorry, can you share with us uh, a little bit about uh, what drew you to your research work in the family relationships um, and specifically parental alienation? So I've been interested in family relationships for a long time. So I completed my honours thesis in that area and my PhD in family relationships. But I became involved in parental alienation when I started in private practice in 2012. And I uh, received a court order to do some family therapy with a very complicated family. And through my work with that family, I realised that there was some very interesting dynamics happening that I didn't understand with this family. And through consultation with colleagues, I heard the term parental alienation. And so I started researching this and trying to make sense of it. And it just, the whole area of research captured my attention. It was heartbreaking and um, intriguing all at the same time. And then I understood, so as I understood parental alienation more, I realised, well, I've also had some of my own personal experiences in my family of this and that it's probably more common than people realise. 
And so when I saw that there was still so much work to be done in this area of research, I decided to set up a research program in the area. And we started with a simple survey where we were asking targeted parents about their experience. And when we proposed to the research, the School of um, Psychological Sciences where I work said, now what will you do if you can't get enough participants to complete your survey? And so we had to have a plan A, B, C and D for that, but we didn't need it because we were just inundated. We had so many people complete the survey and then that just started this whole research program and uh, set up the lab to be focused on this area of work. Wow, that is that is quite a journey. Yes. Uh, and and, yeah. I, and I, I don't think people realize how common this really is. Uh, I'm very similar to yourself. Um, I was in private practice when somebody, when a court case came in and I had mm. always worked with domestic violence and foster children. And, and I saw this child who for all intents and purposes had a great relationship with this parent before. I mean, they used mm. to hunt together. And I think anybody that you'd get up and go hunting with at three o'clock in the morning when it's freezing cold outside, you've got to love that person. Yes. <laughs> and, and this this child was, was literally crawling on the floor and, and grabbing the carpet so that they didn't have to like go into this room. And I had never seen that in, the, in a child that had been physically uh, or sexually abused by a parent and had been removed into our foster care system. So, um, and so once I started doing, I found too that I started to realize that this is way more prevalent than people think. Um, so. Absolutely. Absolutely. Um, yeah. Yeah. Another important part of the story is that um, early on in setting up our research program, I approached the Eeny Meeny Miny Mo Foundation, which is a not-for-profit organisation raising awareness of parental alienation based here in Australia. And uh, the founding director, Amanda Sillers, and I then formed quite a partnership that continues today. And so we work in collaboration with our research, which is um, it's just been invaluable. I think without our collaboration, I don't know if our research would be possible. Oh, that that's wonderful. That that I love the team spirit of coming together like that. Absolutely. Um, so, is there a research project that you've done in PA that you've been really excited about, or is there one that you really want to do? Yes. Uh, so we have started interviewing adults who uh, were exposed to parental alienating behaviours during their childhood and were alienated from a parent as a result of the alienating behaviours. And so we have interviewed 20 individuals so far and we've just started to publish some of our work. We had uh, an open access article published just recently, so that's available for people to access the whole article. And we have heard some really quite horrific stories of trauma and abuse perpetrated by the alienating parent, but we've also heard stories of incredible resilience and um, some of the participants have had contact with their targeted parent, some of them haven't, mm. but that's been a really important study to do and we're continuing to do work in that area where um, planning to interview more participants. We're planning to conduct some surveys and really find out more about their trauma, their experience of trauma, mm -hmm. and hopefully develop some interventions for this group of people. And also hopefully their stories can inform interventions for those children who are in the mire of parental alienation, if you like. And so there's a lot of work to do in an area. Uh, so there will be some more publications to come. Oh, that that sounds very exciting. Um, and and I, I'm going to look that up later on today, <laughs> um, that <laughs> article. Um, so I, as some of our audience members might be struggling right now to find the right professional to work with and, and to really know if the professional is using assessments that are reliable and validated for use with parental alienation. Um, in that type of situation. Could, could you provide our audience with an idea of what assessments are most commonly used um, when they do go to a professional? 
I think if you have been required by court to go along to have an assessment done of the whole family, I think it's important to um, observe that that particular practitioner has the right background experience and qualifications. I think that's really important. I think you can ask if they're aware of parental alienation and um, parental alienating behaviours can find out what their background is and experience and their view is of that. But also you want to know that that practitioner is going to spend a good amount of time with each member of the family that's involved in the alienation and so that they will spend time conducting a good thorough interview with each member of the family. They'll conduct good observations of each family member and try to observe the family members in their different combinations of dyads and triads where it's safe to do so. And hopefully that they will use a variety of valid and reliable assessment tools. And there are many out there. Mm -hmm. um, but I think it's important that they are using valid and reliable um, structured or semi-structured interviews, that they might use a variety of assessment tools if they need to make diagnosis, and that they're using appropriate diagnostic tools if that's appropriate. Mm -hmm. There are a couple of assessment tools that can, I guess, assess for parental alienation, but I think one tool isn't enough. You wanna make sure that your practitioner is using a variety of tools. Mm -hmm. They're also gaining access appropriately to collateral information and that they're doing a very thorough assessment of a combination of um, valid and reliable assessment tools, interviews, observations, and collecting information from collateral sources and pulling that information all together and making an evidence-based decision about what is happening for this family and the family dynamics. Right, so what I hear you saying is there's not one assessment that that somebody would use. So if one is so if they go to a clinician and they pull out just this one assessment and they say, well, boom, boom, there it is, I see it, that might set up some red flags. This is something that has to be in totality. Absolutely. I mean, parental alienation and the parental alienating behaviors are quite complex and family systems are complex. And so you want to make sure that the practitioner is, I guess, appreciating the complexity of that and using a variety of assessment methods to work out what's happening. So let's um, let's shift now to interventions. Um, in 2020, I conducted some research with Amy Baker. We collaborated on um, looking at reunification uh, therapeutic interventions. And uh, based on what we found was However, the, whatever lens the therapist used to conceptualize the case was their approach to their therapy, which is, which is appropriate. However, in some cases, we found that they were using a lot of trauma-focused um, interventions when there hadn't been any um, validated abuse. Um, and so um, can you talk to, talk to our audience about um, if there's an intervention that that you found through your research or you found through um, your work that works best or what are some things that they should look for? Mm. So a few years ago, uh, we conducted a systematic literature review. So we systematically reviewed all the literature on published articles on interventions for parental alienation. And we've just recently completed updating that review. So we've, we've conducted it again and collected recently published articles since our first review. And hopefully we'll have that published later this year. And we found that there are a number of intervention programs that are dedicated to parental alienation. Um, most of them are in the Northern Hemisphere, rather than in Australia, unfortunately. But what we found is that certainly for severe parental alienation, where the relationship between the child and the targeted parent has been completely severed, and it has been determined that parental alienation is what has happened, that an appropriate course of action is to treat the family as though it is a, um, a child safety matter where the child is at risk of harm from the alienating parent, so the one who's making all the allegations. Um, that can't be substantiated of abuse. And so 
what they would do is they would transfer custody over to the targeted parent, which is considered the safer parent in this scenario, and there would be some targeted interventions to help the child and the targeted parent, I guess, build their relationship. And that often happens very quickly once the transfer of custody occurs. And then there are targeted interventions for the alienating parent to see if they're able to change their behaviours uh, and their beliefs and attitudes around the other parent and the child. And if it's possible to do so, see if um, a shared parenting or custody arrangement can then occur, um, but often in severe alienation, the alienating parent struggles to make the necessary changes for that to happen. So they're the kind of interventions that seem to be most appropriate. Mm -hmm. And I think also from my view, not so much from research, but from my own clinical work, that there does need to be some trauma-focused work with the child mm -hmm. because parental alienating behaviours, I'm of the view that parental alienating behaviours are a form of child abuse. And so you are dealing with a child who is very traumatised from that experience. Mm -hmm. Right. I, I think what we found a lot was the child was being um, was was being treated as a trauma victim from the targeted parent, not from the alienating parent. We found that. So, yeah, so that's what we found that was uh, that they were actually just treating the child um, mm -hmm. as if the targeted parent was actually the abuse, the abusing parent instead of the alienating parent being the abusive parent. Yeah, that, that type of intervention just reinforces the parental alienation and keeps the child uh, suspended in the abusive situation that they're in. Yeah. So um, so we fortunately, we've come to the end of our time. I would love to continue this conversation with you. But thank you so much for being here today. Thank you for taking time out. Um, I know you have to go to a class in a, in a little bit here. So I really appreciate you making time for us today. Thank you for inviting me. Thank you very much. Um, and to our audience, thank you for joining us today. And don't forget, if you need prayer, send us your prayer requests and we will stand in faith with you. And we commit to praying over all of the prayer requests that come to us. I thank you. And we will see you next time on Families Divided. Next week, Lisa Rothfuss speaks on what the alienated child won't tell you.